And good evening, everyone, or good morning, good afternoon, wherever the hell you are on the planet. Anyway, it's Tashian Miller, and we're here with episode 112 of Kudan Radio. So um, during today's episode, we're going to be discussing three different abilities or something like that, right? Abilities. <clears throat> and we're going to take a look at this transition uh, or transcendence kind of thing, right? Um, moving from this idea of base martial arts to this idea of invincibility, invisibility, that kind of stuff, right? That this, you know, the stuff that really gets our, 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 I don't know, our imaginations running and all that. I know way back in uh, late 1979, early 80, uh, when I first encountered this idea of uh, needed to, which is my camera here, <clears throat> uh, this idea of needed to, I had already done God, a couple of dozen different martial arts and, uh, Again, it was one of those things that within two paragraphs of uh, of reading this one article, right, I knew I needed to know more. And the more I learned and the more I experienced, right, with this, it went way beyond what I saw as uh, martial arts, self-defense, fighting, that kind of stuff, right? The stuff that drew me to the martial arts originally. But again, three abilities. We'll talk about this more when we get back. Uh, and uh, so let's go ahead and officially kick things off as soon as I get to the right place on my on my uh, screen here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Excellent. Let's do it. So the big question is this. How are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kuden Radio, real training for real people in a real world. And that's the real truth. Anyway, a um, little warm where I am in the world, but you know what? I'm not going to complain about it because every time I think about something like that, uh, I think about what uh, some of the uh, monks in the temples that I go to in Japan that are associated with this uh, whole Tendai Mikyo thing that I do. Uh, if you complain about being really, really hot in the summertime, uh, they'll look at you and go, oh, really hot? Huh. What will you do when you go to hell? Right? Um, same thing if it's really, really cold in the wintertime, right? Oh, really cold. Oh. Same thing. What will you do when you go to hell, right? Um, and that normally comes about because Japanese temples uh, are very, very open, right? They have shoji screens and it's nothing but wooden paper, right? So there's no heating systems. There's no uh, air conditioning, whatever. You might luck out and be there on a day where they're running one of these Goma fire ceremonies in the wintertime. Because in the summertime, it just adds a whole lot of extra heat that... Uh, you know, but what do they say, James? It's a dry heat. <laughs> anyway, all right. So uh, we've been talking about this. If you've been following along with the different episodes, you know that this thing was coming. Uh, uh, this this topic was coming. But um, anyway, so you know, when 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 a lot of people think about needs to, I mean, it's you know, it, it's become ninja has become such a such a everyday word right? In our, in our culture, right? In the West, right? Uh, kids run around all the time you know, saying things like, oh, that's so ninja. Well, what the hell does that mean, right? They normally mean that, it, that it's tricky. It's whatever, right? Uh, but in the early days of my training, um, I encountered like really, really lofty ideals, like, like the idea that if somebody sees you being tricky, right? Or, or recognizes that you were tricky, you were deceptive, you whatever, right? Uh, you already lost, you already failed, okay? So being ninja, right? While it's most associated, again, conventionally 
with this idea of trickiness, it's it's not that, right? Because that's that's obvious, right? Uh, overt trickiness, right? It's, it's very, very, very odd. Uh, and for a lot of folks, even even a lot of practitioners, it's very, very difficult to get their head wrapped around exactly what this is. And I think the problem with it is in where the mind is directed, right? Um, and so in today's world, right, I mean, what most people are calling needed to is, is such a, such a, hmm, it's like a shadow of itself, right? Um, well, I don't know if you know it's right or not. I'm telling you <laughs> from my perspective and what we did back in the early eighties. Uh, and then, you know, there were all these transitions, right? There are all these changing points in time where, you know, things got adjusted, right? Uh, the highest rank used to be fifth don, right? And there were certain things that came with that. And then there were a bunch of fifth dons running around. So five more dons were added to that. And then the top rank was 10th don. And then, you know, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, right? And then the next thing you know, you get 15th don. Next thing you know, you get Dai Shihan, right? So, you know, I take a lot of these things um, with a grain of salt because um, the they're points in time, right? And and there's all these little changing kind of things that go along, right? But what I wanted to share during this episode was to take a look at some of these ideals, some of these really high-end kind of uh, uh, targets, right? Or goals or aims or whatever that we were shooting for, right? And the way things were described, like this concept of the Tatsujin, right? Tatsujin. Um, this was a... Uh, a um, this was a, a theme of one of our uh, previous uh, yearly ninja camps, right? Living to the Tatsujin, right? So if you're uh, one of my students that are involved in the Mikyo training as well, and you you, you know you understand the, the layout of the mandala, it doesn't matter if it's the Taizokai or the Kongokai mandala, it's easier to see on the Taizokai than it is on the, on the Kongokai. The Taizokai, for those of you who are just new to this, it's one with a big figure in the middle, and there's an eight- a red eight petaled lotus around it. And then there's a character on each one of uh, those uh, petals as well. But it's that one in the center, right? And so Tatsujin, this concept is the, the fully actualized human being. Okay. And I don't mean that this person is superhuman because that's the, that's the fantasy that's sold in the movies, right? The person is superhuman, right? Can't be killed. They can be beaten almost to death and they're going to be, you know, come back within minutes or seconds or whatever and kill all the bad guys and all that. It's not about being superhuman. It's about being suprahuman, right? Which means as many faculties as we can have firing are going to be firing, right? So, um, Again, Tatsujin was a term that was used uh, for a while in, in ancient Japan uh, as, a, as a term to identify a master swordsman. And what they're talking about is someone who is so expert at what they're doing that what they're doing and the way they do it almost seems magical, right? Like it, it almost seems like they're breaking natural laws to make things happen, right? Of course they're not. What they're doing is they're they're operating in a realm and they're doing things and they can see things, recognize things and use things that most people don't even know exist or are happening or whatever. And if they do, um, they have certain beliefs about them that, well, you know, just there's nothing you can do about that. Right. So, again, there's this idea of the Tatsujin. Right. And then that that was this overarching kind of ideal. Right. And then everything else kind of fit around that, right? If we look at the kuji, right, these nine syllables, uh, you know, in the Japanese translation, uh, Japanese transliteration of the Chinese transliteration of the original Sanskrit, right? This rin pyo to shakai jin or netzai zen, it's a sentence, right? It's a sentence that means the warriors are a master around the fortress or a master around the castle. But that each of these syllables represents a uh, a skill or ability, right? Three of which are in the physical realm, three of which are in the, what we would normally call the psychological or mental realm, and three are in a realm that we would normally call 
spirit or spiritual or whatever. I don't mean um, I don't mean religious, right? I just mean that uh, it's more in the in the realms of, uh, of ESP and stuff like that. Not like you know, just chant a whole lot and woo and magical woo woo kind of stuff happens, right? Uh, in the in Sanskrit, in the in the old uh, teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads and things like that, they were called siddhis, right, or magical powers. And it's again, it's not like you know you're just waving your waving your fingers or waving your fingers and saying things and whatever, and then poof, something happens. Um, it's a tapping into things and a, and a firing up of faculties, right? Because ultimately, right, I mean, spiritual is uh, spiritual is things that we can't pin down as being mental, right? Um, it's n- normally, things that are happening at an experiential level very right brain, multifaceted, that kind of thing. Uh, left brain doesn't talk to that very well, can't understand it, those kind of things, right? So anyway, so um, the Kuji kind of fits into those things, right? Um, but in and around that idea, right, we were given this, we were given this kind of a transcendent kind of stepping stone, uh, it's kind of difficult to, to describe. Um, well, uh, well, how about if we just start at the ideal, right? Um, start at the ideal, and this is actually out of one of the uh, one of the really really old scrolls. I think, I'm pretty sure Hatsumi Sensei has mentioned this in different contexts. Uh, Stephen Hayes actually discusses it at the tail end of one of the books. So I can't remember if it's Ninjutsu: Art of the Invisible Warrior. It's a big white book, big white paperback by uh, published by contemporary or if it was the companion book that came out later uh mystic arts of the ninja that one's same size but it's black right there but both of them he's on the front in a in a sword pose uh in on the on the book are the invisible warrior he's in daijodan no kamai so the sword's up over top big white book <coughs> excuse me allergies um and in the uh, in Mystic Arts, on the front, there's a there's a gate or a, yeah, there's a gate behind him, and he's in either Gaidan or Tosui or something like that, right? Um, but he describes, or he he uh, has uh, a little write up, just it's just a brief write up about uh, uh, for the translation, right, from the scrolls, which has to do with becoming invisible in the eyes of the enemy, right? So the way this stuff was described and the way it was kind of framed, right? The ideal in Nijutsu, in Ninpo, right? The ideal is to be able to set your life up in a way that no one would ever see you as a target. They would never see you as a threat, a target, a victim. They would have no reason to attack you, right? Well, that's pretty freaking cool. Right. Um, You're able to be successful. You're able to do whatever it is you're doing. But no one. No one sees you as somebody that is, you know, that that they're going to come after. Right. And ultimately. Right. If you're really serious about self-protection, if we're honest with ourselves. Right. And we're really serious about self-protection because I I, I had to come to grips with this. Right. For the longest time, I did the same thing everybody else did. Right. Martial arts, bad guy comes, kick his ass, call it a day. Right. So I wanted the best tactics, techniques, whatever. But that's where my brain was stuck. Right. And then, you know, it's like the more I explored violence and conflict and and things like that, and the more I came to understand that people attack in way more ways than just physically. Right. Physical violence. It's the the old adage that violence isn't always the answer. Right. Um, Is absolutely true. It's not always the answer. In some instances, it actually escalates things and creates a bigger problem you could ever than you could ever solve, right? And even if I do act, right, um, then do I have to have eyes in the back of not only my head but my family's head, my friends, all that? Because some bad guys they can't get at you; they're going to get at things that will hurt you nonetheless, right? And hurt others that you're there to protect. So this took quite a while, right? Um, exploring things and then diving even deeper into this system to to really get my head wrapped around 
these ideals, right? Because, you know, the first question that came up for me when it came to setting up my life so that no one would ever think of attacking me is, well, how the hell is that different from anybody else that's a peace loving, um, you know, individual that, you know, tries to go through life, not offending, not, you know, whatever, not they, they stay away from the rough areas of town. How is that any different? Well, the answer is the difference is one person sets up their life so that no one ever thinks of attacking them. But should that fail, then what? The other person does things in a way that creates a life where the end result is no one would ever think of attacking you. Okay? So one starts with hope and ends with a prayer. And one starts with uh, very specific, intentional training skill sets and things like that. And over time, almost as a side effect, right? So one is, you know, you get the idea, right? So, but the, the, the goal as a ninja is to be able to set your life up so that you can work your will. It's, the rough translation is work your will without action. And the reality is there's always action. But no one understands how that is working, right? They see what you're doing, right? It's kind of like watching a magician. You see, you see everything that's happening, right? What you don't see is the little moves that occur that, that really the trick is, is done, right? Um, what most people, you know, when they're, when they're trying to catch the magician, right? They're watching all the moves. They're watching the hands and everything. But the reality, here's the secret, right? The trick was done before they started the moves. The trick was done before they said, hey, would you like to see a trick? It's already done. Okay. So you're watching for nothing. You're watching, you're just chasing your own mental aberrations around, right? So um, either way, right? So what we're looking at, the, the end result, but this is really, really freaking difficult. This takes a long time, right? What happens if you know, in the process of setting up my life, right? Um, or thinking I've got my shit together, right? Setting up my life so that nobody ever comes at me. But in reality, how, how much stuff comes at us on a regular basis, right? From nature, whether it's illness or calamities or, you know, death of a loved one or whatever, right? Um, or it's, uh, you know, people yelling and screaming at you or, people with this or that ideologies or agendas or whatever, trying to manipulate and play you, uh, you know, advertising, all kinds of crap, right? So um, what happens when the bad guy comes and you don't have everything already set up? Ah, right? So I'm actually doing this backwards, right? So the ideal, right? The ideal, which makes a lot of people frustrated because they're spending all this time, effort, money, training, blood, sweat, tears, or whatever to develop, to develop these skills, and the irony, the ironic part about this, and Hatsumi Sensei has discussed this, right? Um, I remember one year he was laughing pretty good um, about this because, uh, one, martial arts training is very expensive, okay? Um, and two, the more you train and the better you get, the less likely you're going to need to use those same skills. But what's really happening is other things, right? There are these these invisible skills or soft skills or whatever that are being developed that cause you to make decisions a different way, cause you to act on information and subtle cues and whatnot in a way where, and see, here's the second level, right? If, if I'm not quite there, right? And my life has not been set up right there, are bad guys, right? There's all this kind of stuff that can happen, right? So in lieu of having that, right? While I'm still working on it, in lieu of having that, I develop escape skills. I develop skills that allow me to assess and escape a situation uh, or to create, uh, you know, uh, tactics and whatnot that allow me to hide, escape from whatever danger that's coming in my direction, right? But this requires not just like awareness skills, right? It, it, it requires um, the ability to do mental assessments, on, you know, on the fly, moving into a, into a new location. I don't care if it's a restaurant or, uh, you know, a, a 
concert that you're going to or, uh, you know, grocery store, whatever, right? Um, you can very, very quickly establish a baseline. And then you've got these assessment faculties that are watching for certain things without being paranoid or hypervigilant or whatever, right? But the trick here is in being able to create uh, distractions, to create um, uh, escape plans, all those kind of things, right? So that, again, the primary goal is to be able to do things as a ninja, to be able to do things so that danger can't touch me. Okay? It can't touch me. Right. So ideal, right. The end game is set up my entire life so that no attacker would ever think of, of coming at me. Right. When that can't be done or when, you know, there's shit like natural calamities and stuff like that. Right. It's not a, it's not an attacker. It's, you know, there's forces at play in, in the solar system and the universe and whatnot that just shit happens. Right. Solar flares. Right. That, you know, everybody wants to write off as, uh, you know, there's a reason that it's it's hotter here and it's because of factories. Well, maybe so. But you know what? It gets pretty damn hot when a solar flare occurs. And, um, you know, uh, maybe we're going to control the sun, too. I don't, I don't know. Right. And we'll just flip that light switch so that it goes off and then we don't have to worry about those kind of things. But then I think it'd be, get pretty damn cold. But anyway. <laughs> right. So. Uh, and again, please, for, for everybody that likes to jump on the agenda bandwagon and have their nostrils yanked around by everybody with a good, logical story, right? I'm not having these arguments, okay? Because the trick with ninja training is is to be able to understand both sides, okay? To listen to both sides and know when they're both right and they're both wrong, just about different shit. And if they would just shut the hell up and listen to each other and initially plan to work together instead of just wanting everything their own way, like their damn six-year-olds, slap fighting in a, in a sandbox, we might actually get some shit done. But until then, you know what? I'm not talking to any of you. So, um, so that being said, right? Okay. So when the ideal falls, right? I'm, the goal is still, right? To be able to act in a way, right? That danger can't touch me. Okay. So next stage when that fails is evacuation plans, escape, Right. Uh, disappearing from his line of sight. Right. Escape tactics, uh, you know, stealth, all that kind of stuff. Right. So there's this whole other realm of training. Right. And I know people like to talk about these things a lot. Right. I just don't see a lot of it going on. Right. You know, the least viewed of my videos on YouTube are the ones where we're talking taxes, taxes and strategies that don't that don't have to do with wiping the floor with somebody's ass. Right. Because everybody wants to be Superman. Right. And they completely forget that regardless of gun laws or whatever, right? It's when you just shoot you in the face from across the street, right? Here in the States, we're going through this whole thing again, right? With gun control and all that. Well, you know what? I was a counterterrorism, counterterrorism operative in what was then West Germany way back in the early and mid 80s, right? They've had serious gun control since 1932, right? You know what they did there? They blew people up, right? So uh, bad people nutcases will always find a way to hurt other people, right? There's examples in the previous and, and just here recently, right? right? In lieu of guns, drive their truck or their van into a freaking crowd of people and take out a whole bunch. So, you know, um, anyway, right? So anyway, um, so the, the, the next step down again is to, is to, you know, disappear, right? Don't be there when the danger happens or to learn how, you know, escape and evasion and all that kind of stuff, right? Not the coolest thing in the world. Of course, you know, to most martial arts minded or fighter minded people, setting up your life so that danger never comes is either unthinkable or unwantable because they want to be the tough guy on the block, right? They want to be the guy that everybody fears. They want to be the guy that can kick everybody's ass. Okay. Well, Okay, so ninjutsu is not for you, at least not now, right? So it's only when, again, got the ideal, that's failed, at least in the moment, or we're not quite there yet. So second level is being able to assess a situation, change the dynamics, whatever, right? And escaping isn't always escaping from the area, right? It's being able to, sometimes it's being able to convince somebody that you're not a threat in the moment, 
right? So Henso Jutsu, disguise and impersonation, and Intel Jutsu, right? Uh, stealth kind of things, right? Stealing in, entering, escaping, all those kind of things, right? In lieu of that, then you better have some physical skills, right? If you if your life's not set up to where danger is never going to come at you, and you don't have, you know, the kind of assessment skills and escape abilities, you know, uh, that James Bond or MacGyver or whatever used to be, uh, you know, known for, for those of you who are old enough to remember those shows, right? <coughs> then you're going to have to duck punches. You're going to have to avoid blades. You're going to have to, uh, you know, do this stuff that has everybody, you know, has 90% or better of the art, right, of practitioners in the art busy, right? Because we haven't set things up in a way. So we are potential targets, right? You get the, you get the idea, right? And we don't have the ability or for, forethought or, or mechanisms set up to detect danger far enough out that by the time it gets to the location where I am, I'm no longer in that location. Right? Uh, how's me since I answered a question for somebody one time, and this was like, wait, wow. We're talking way back, early 80s. Um, he was talking about uh, Saki, right? Feel, uh, detecting the force of the killer. Kuji, even higher level than that and whatnot. And somebody just you know, he was taking questions and somebody said, well, you know, let's say that there's a sniper, right, out, you know, across the street on a building, right? And like you, when you walk through that door right there, he's going to shoot you, right? How would you defend against that? And Hatsumi said, I just smiled and looked at him and said, I wouldn't walk through that door. Well, it sounds like a cop out to most people, Right. Other people go, well, yeah, but how would you know that he was, well, one, we don't have the time to cover all the training that goes into knowing, and two, most people wouldn't believe it because it's going to sound too woo-woo, and two, most people aren't going to do that much work in that direction because it's freaking boring, right? You're not blocking, you're not punching, you're not doing wrist locks, you're not doing throws, but either way, right? So the first stage in invincibility training, right, is actual physical self-defense. It's also your, your safety net when the ideal and the second level fail. When you have no other choice, it's there, right? But these things are all to be transcended, right? At a certain point, there... I may learn new kata from teachers in Japan. I may, you know, learn new little nuances and things like that, right? But I got to tell you, 90% of it anymore looks the same. I don't care what the kata is called. The principles and concepts and strategies and all that kind of stuff are the same. There's just new nuances or we're looking at how to fit that into this kind of scenario or that kind of scenario or whatever, right? It's not the, the, the physical stuff tends to run out. And that's why most people end up dropping out of martial arts at a certain point once they think they got it, okay? Because it doesn't feel like they're learning anything new. But it's at that stage, actually, it should come before that because while you're working on physical self-defense, you're also working on awareness, you're working on timing, you're working on picking up on in, um, uh, uh, intent, right? You're working on intuitive um awareness and, and, and these subtle skills, right? You're picking up on those things. Now it's time to extend them out farther, right? It's time to start working on creative application, right? It's time to start working on uh, second, this maybe second or outer ring of defense, right? Uh, I've covered this in, in other, other classes where we talk about three rings of defense, right? I do this with my uh, corporate workplace violence consultants, uh, we do what we cover, home security, all that kind of stuff, right? So if you just had a piece of paper, and again, those of you who are listening uh, on the audio-only stuff on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and all that, uh, you can't see what I'm doing uh, with the folks that are on live. But you know, if you took a piece of paper, and you just draw a bullseye, right? You just make a, a small circle, right? Doesn't have to be tiny. Make a small circle, right, in the middle of the, of the paper. And then 
make a larger one around that and then make a larger one around that. So you get these three rings, right? So the first ring represents you. Just write you, right? You can pre- not, not the letter U, Y-O-U, right? You in the, in the middle right there, okay? So that's skills and techniques and tactics and all that wonderful stuff, right? For when shit's actually coming at you, the knives and the fist and the feet and whatever are coming at you and you have no, you have no choice, right? <clears throat> the danger's right there in your face. The next ring out, so the middle ring, right? The second ring out, right? That's, um, we'll call it friends and family, or even you could even extend it to uh, community, right? So that's your, that's your close knit, you know, it could be your, your neighbors, right? Your friends, your family, whatever. Those people who are watching your back, you're watching theirs, okay? So the second ring of security is not the blades are coming at you or whatever. It's people kind of, it's neighbors watching neighbors, right? You're on vacation. So your neighbor's watching your house. They're on vacation or they work a different shift than you do. So, you, you know, you notice that there's a, you know, different vehicle in the, in the parking right, in their in their driveway or whatever, right? That kind of thing. Right. And then the third ring out, right. Is social national, whatever, right. It's typically, governmental security, okay? Police, other uh, private security, maybe if it's around where you work or whatever, right? Um, uh, uh, Military, that kind of stuff, right? So what you're really looking at is this outer ring, right? Are people working to keep you safe? And you don't even know who they are. You can't even see them. Every once in a while, you might see a police car go by or whatever, right? But you have no clue about how big that safety net is to keep 90% of the shit that could come at you from ever touching you, right? And then the next ring in is for stuff that gets through that. But now you got the neighborhood watch or you got, you know, your uh, brother lives next door or you're ill. And so your family's kind of making sure that you're okay uh, and nobody, you know. Takes, takes advantage of you during that time or whatever, right? So things that could get through that or that are too small for that bigger safety net to catch, now you get the second ring if you're developing it, right? If you're developing it, right? Otherwise, it just kind of happens accidentally or you have to just hope, right? So you've got that. And then, right, and that's going to handle, what, 98% of the things that might come at that ring, right? And then you only have this small kind of thing that might happen every once in a while, depending on where you live, right? Um, and then, you know, if, if something's actually physically coming at you, right? So here's the thing, right? Most people don't even give any thought to the second and third rings, right? The, the neighborhood, friends, family ring, and the greater social safety net, right? I give any thought to that when they're thinking about self-defense, right? They're thinking about the worst possible thing, right? Which is the hardest thing to defend yourself against, right? Somebody who's toe to toe, nose to nose, coming at you with blades, bullets, fists, whatever, right? It's not, not important, right? But it takes longer to develop that kind of thing, but either way, right? So here's this thing. The problem is that everybody gets, they're all, they, they just get all caught up in that, Right. And they can't see beyond that. But that's not needed to. It well, it's a part of needed to. Right. A small part. Okay, In the beginning of this episode, I said, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) I don't think I brought my inhaler down here with me. Oh, well. So if I hack to death and have an asthma attack and pass out, James will take over. So (laughs) anyway, that's just one of the shitty times of the year. Anyway, um, so again, everybody gets caught up in that, right? Um, and and the, the personal defense stuff, right, is a part of needed to. But remember in the very beginning, what I said was, um, if, you're, if whatever you're doing, right, is found out, right? Let's, you know, going back to that, that teenagers and everybody, you know, calls tricky things. Oh, that's so ninja, right? If somebody can see you being tricky, they, you get called out on it, right? 
if it's illegal, your ass is going to jail, right? Or you get sued or whatever, right? Not very ninja-like, right? Because not, not very invisible, right? But everybody's trying to do all this stuff, right? Um, one of the most ninja things I was ever told, right, by Hatsumi Sensei and by my earlier teachers in this art, when we were hyper-focused on living and thinking like a ninja, not, uh, not this other half-baked crap, right, was you don't break the laws, right? You don't break the rule. I mean, if you do, you take personal responsibility for it, but everybody wants to run around and be counterculture that way. What we were told was know the laws better than those who wrote them so that you can navigate the same way they do, okay? They have, they have loopholes in place so that they can navigate, right? Instead of bitching and complaining about all these things that are set up and, well, that they, they, they got this stuff and I, well, how about doing some study? How about figuring out what they are? Because you know what? They may not like that you're doing what you're doing, but they can't stop you because it's not illegal. And for them to make it illegal, they have to close loopholes that they need. So this requires study that's outside of the realm of ducking punches and blocking and kicking. And again, you know, the shit that has everybody else all caught up, right? And it's not that, again, it's not that it's not important, right? But that physical self-defense stuff, right? That kind of quote unquote invincibility that people fantasize and look for only goes so far. Okay. And it's only the first phase of this goal, right? To prevent danger from touching me. Because the first lesson we teach you is what? Evasion. Well, the first lesson I was taught and teach everybody, right? Is evasion. If you can't hit me, he can't hurt me. And if he can't hurt me, he can't beat me. Okay. Same goes for words. Same goes for any other kind of an attack. But we start physically. Okay. The ultimate goal, and what? how would your training be different if you described it this way? The goal of my training is to keep danger from touching me or those I'm responsible for. How would your training look different? Okay. But all three phases is exactly the same goal. You just have greater abilities, right? So... When I first started this episode, I was talking about the three abilities. So the first ability, right, is adaptability and capability, right? I can adapt to what danger is coming at me. I'm capable. I've got skill sets and all that for handling, handling actual physical violence, okay? But I need to transcend that, right? Because the reality is, Physical self-defense provides the greatest chance of something going wrong, no matter how good you are. If Hatsumi Sensei admitted this, being at his level, none of us <laughs> have anything better than that, right? People want to fantasize about being like Hatsumi Sensei, but they miss all of these lessons, right? The reason a ninja loses if he's dis if he's discovered is that even if even if the ninja has to use his physical skills, right? Sword, staff, gun, taijutsu, whatever, right? You were still discovered. They can still track you down even if you even if you won that little skirmish against that guard or that samurai or whatever. Okay? I know this. I'm an ex-federal cop, right? Even if you got away from the cops in the moment, right? Uh, we had a we had a we had a, a saying way back in the day, right? I don't care how fast your car is, you can't outrun Motorola, right? That's the radios, right? Or the eye in the sky, right? The the police chopper and all that. But either way, right? Even if you got away from us today, there's now a freaking all points bulletin, right? Or a bolo, be on the lookout, out citywide. Countywide, statewide, whatever. It's only a matter of time, right? It's only a matter of time. So, but either way, right? Physical stuff coming at me. I need to transcend that, right? At a certain point, I'm going to have a decent skill set. I'm going to have a decent skill set. Now, the trick is, how do I let it, how do I keep it from getting to where I run the risk of ending up in the ER or the morgue? Or even if I survive, 
my kid got killed in the process or my wife got injured in the process or whatever. Yeah, I still wrecked this guy, except now she's crippled for life or whatever. So how do I keep from getting to that point, right? So now I need to be looking. My training needs to take on a whole new dynamic, right? So assessment skills, awareness, intu you know, intuition, that Saki, right? That fifth Don test that everybody wants to pass so they can, ooh, you know, set for the sword test that I passed. Yeah. Okay. But what did you do after that? Where did you take your training after that point? Because that's not just the passing of a test. So you can get some cool rank and pay your three, 400 bucks or whatever it is, right? And get your Shidoshi. But it's the initiation to a whole new realm of training that has to do with an intuitive sense and an intuitive knowing that shit's not right and dangers come, dangers imminent or coming or whatever, right? So how do I, how do I do that, right? This whole realm that again the goal is still, right? How do I keep danger from touching me or those I'm responsible for, right? But in this case, they can't see me, or even if they did, I'm gone in the next instant or whatever it is, negotiation tactics, whatever, right? So that gets taken care of, right? So now I'm very good at this second level of ability, right? Ingenuity and creativity, right? To where I can create plans and alter egos and guises and whatever it takes right? To make the danger stop or dissipate before it touches me or somebody I'm responsible for, right? I don't care if it's distraction tactics, dissuasion tactics, escape tactics, whatever. These things have nothing to do with blocking, punching, kicking. And why would they? I've already spent my time doing those kind of things. And I still train every once in a while. I'm, I'm speaking third person, right? I still train every once in a while to make sure those things are still good, Right. But they those things also have to adapt as I get older, as maybe physical uh, condition changes or whatever. Right. Um, things have to change. Right. OK. We don't just we don't get all these skills set when we're 25 or 27 and we're peak of health and all that. And then, in, in you know, we're 65 or 70 and we're deluding ourselves, believing that we can still do things the same way that we could when we were 25 or 28 or 30 or whatever, right? This is just, again, we have to escape ego's grasp. And part of ego's grasp is to create fantasy worlds about, ooh, this is me in the perfect state. Yeah, well, don't forget all the other variables, right? But either way, right? So I've got the, I've got the physical skills pretty much taken care of, right? But I also recognize in the training to handle physical attacks, that's the last place most people want to get. And I don't want to be there unless it's, I've got no other choice. And I know, I mean, we're watching numbers go up and down and all that kind of stuff. So I'm usually hitting little hot points because I either pop somebody's fantasy bubble or I'm boring and they were waiting for me to show some cool move or whatever. And that's fine. Um, but I get that. And then I have this, again, these are those epiphanies. I learned these three phases. It was just this little description here. This is ultimate goal. This is your backup goal. This is your place to start because you don't have any of this other shit in place, right? But it took me decades to get my head wrapped around that, to go through this training and recognize, shit, there's a certain order to this, not just because somebody arbitrarily threw it together, but this is, this is based on, this is based on reality. This is based on looking at self-protection and success and, and those kind of things from a very, very different viewpoint of this 20 something who was raised by an abusive stepdad who was driven into law enforcement, security, military, and uh, self-protection training, martial arts, right? Because of the, the need to not ever feel afraid and you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Listen to episode 68, you'll, you'll get the whole thing, right? Um, but hold, it, it was gonna require a whole different perspective. In Mikio, we call it a, tur a turning in the seat of consciousness. Right. And each level requires a turning. Right. 
does that mean that each, you know, when you transcend, right, that the other stuff becomes uh, less important or unimportant? No, it's just a whole different realm. It's a whole different aspect of the training, right? So it's like those three rings that I gave you, right? You, friends, family, neighborhood patrol, whatever, right? Your community, your town, whatever, right? And then, you know, military, police, whatever, all this stuff out here, right? Okay, it's the same thing, right? We've got this global kind of, you know, thing. But if you if you see the transition, I go from being able to handle physical assaults and I get that corner of my world taken care of, right? I understand how to do that, right? Okay. I don't want to go there any more than anybody else does. And anybody that wants to go there either has nothing to lose or doesn't understand the full scope of, of what can go wrong, okay? Um, transitioning into this whole realm of well, let's call it tricky ninja, right? Where, but nobody knows that you're doing anything, right? You're paying attention when nobody thinks you're paying attention, right? Um, all that stuff, right? And what you're paying attention to, they have no clue, right? They, they've known zero, zero clue, right? But all of that together and some other things that has to do with life success and the way you carry yourself and controlling and, and uh, chaining up ego and all these personality kind of things and whatnot, right? Um, all of those things go together for this third level of, you know, setting yourself up so no one would ever think of attacking you, right? Either they don't see you as a challenge or they have maybe some, they, they might have some thoughts about it but they've seen you in action in other ways or they know, right, that they, they know how much they don't know and that not knowing, right, part of that third level of setting things up is not telling everybody about everything uh, about yourself, right, which is pretty funny because um, at a certain level you can be absolutely transparent and most people aren't going to understand half of what, you, what, what the hell you're talking about anyway. Right. So it's you can just you can just tell everybody. Right. They're not going to believe you or they're going to have no anchor, no reference points. Right. But again, we had this high ideal. Then there's a the backup and then there's the what well, since you don't have this other stuff. Right. So right, it, it, it kind of works in both both directions. Right. But I, I think people are missing that. I, don't th I'm, I can't say for sure because I haven't met, what, 98.9% .9 of the Bujinkan or people in DG2 or whatever, but um, people are missing this, right? Their idea of DG2 and mastery, right, stops with cool techniques and cool weapons and talking about names on a history roster. But they have no clue. Zero. Right. So what do we need? We need to have a more clear picture. Right. If we're really aiming for this thing. Right. Now, it, again, if, if somebody's goal is just to be the next MMA champion or to be seen as the guy, then I'm OK. Cool. Okay. <coughs> if nothing else, we can be friends. Okay? That's on the good side. On the bad side, they're one of the distractions that I use in my life right, to keep people from coming at me. Okay. Oh, you want a real threat? I'm nothing compared to that guy. <laughs> right? So, um, again, it, you know, it's perspective and whatnot. So, anyway, um, maybe this would wasn't as important impressive or, you know, magic tricks aren't nearly as awe-inspiring and magical once somebody knows the trick. Okay. They feel smarter. Oh, well, was... but then they also feel like they were duped because they can't believe that it was that simple. I think people want to fantasize. I think people want they want to dream more than they want to do. 
Okay. Here's something me and my team are working on, right? Uh, I've been talking to them for the last bunch of weeks and months and whatnot. And sometimes I'm not, not a, I don't, like, James will have to, and, and James knows that I'm okay with him telling me the truth, right? But he'll have to let me know whether I'm deluded or not, right? Um, I don't think I'm a slave driver, but I do remind people that we need to get certain things done, right? Because ideas are not the seeds for success. Okay. In the business world, right? Ideas make no money. Okay. I bet each individual, each individual that is watching this now or whatever, right? You're watching a recording in the future. You have had several great ideas this week or this month. Been able to take them to the bank. Do you barely remember them when you put them together? Okay. Ideas are nothing. Okay. They're at best a starting point. Execution, on the other hand, produces success, produces results, produces money, produces happiness. Okay. Nothing does nothing until it's executed upon. And ninja, the epitome of warriors, are men and women of action. We execute on ideas. Doing it tomorrow pisses me off because I don't have enough time in my day. This past week, we had a kids camp that I run at the school. And it's really great because, you know, we can get other kids that come in that parents might be interested in keeping their kids and stuff. Uh, you know, the kids that are already in, in the school, right? We can do some really, really cool stuff. Take them on nature walks. I did plant identification with them. Uh, we looked at different processes in nature, all that kind of stuff. They got extra classes and fitness and and all kinds of cool stuff, right? They got the chance to do all this ninja stuff. Um but I got little to nothing extra done. Like my normal projects got rolled back, maybe 20 to 30% of my stuff that I get done. And instead of going to sleep at between two and 4 a.m., I know, I know, I'm a slacker. I get up at 7.30, 7, 7.30 in the morning, go to sleep between two and four o'clock in the morning because I got shit to do, right? And no, I'm not a workaholic, right? I have targets, right? I have missions. Um, I was falling asleep last night. Um, I felt I was starting to fall asleep at 1030 in the evening. Holy shit. <laughs> I see this little grade screen with James off in the background and he's laughing now, but James eyebrows almost went to his hairline. Right? <laughs> 1030. Holy shit. <laughs> and that was after a weekend of, well, you know, relaxing and, and whatnot. I had my, grandson on Saturday. And then yesterday, the wife and I tried to do some stuff, but man, so um, now I'm all set. I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed and ready to go. So uh, maybe my body just needed to reset, but it becomes an irritation. Right. So uh, anyway, right? Uh, the coup, I guess the coup den, right? The secret, right? The void transmission here is, um, your training will always produce, at best, the training that you define. Right? And I absolutely do believe that 90% or better of practitioners today, that they, they don't have the ideals. They don't have the aims. They were, these things were never discussed with them or described or whatever to point out where this is supposed to go, right? Your body ultimately is not invincible. It's not invisible. So how the hell does that work? Because that's the third ability, right? I talked about the three abilities, right? First ability was adaptability and capability, right? So skill sets, being able to adapt and handle different types of physical situations and things like that, right? The second ability is the ingenuity and creativity, right? And it, it, to some degree, there's an adaptability to it because you're able to, to kind of adapt to situations. Everything becomes about context, right? At a certain point, everything becomes about context. But the second ability is ingenuity and creativity, right? So the whole first level, um, I would say 
80, 90% is physical. Then there's some mental and some emotional, spiritual kind of stuff in there. But 80% are better. It's physical, right? Second level, second ability, 80% are better is mental with some physical and a little bit more emotional, spiritual, right? Third level, that third ability, invincibility, invisibility. Oh man, the skill set. Holy shit. Right? The, 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 the level of tactical, tactical and strategic thinking and, but even, even more so, right? It's more of a guiding, right? One of my teachers way back in the day used to describe, and I know some of you guys, you know, you, all, all games are about buttons and levers kind of thing, right? Um, watch an old Little House on the Prairie or one of these old TV shows or whatever about people in the plains and whatever, right? Um, one of the games that the kids had, now I was inner city, so we had tires, right? The, the things we made toys of, right? Okay, But you get this wheel rolling, right? And they would do it with wagon wheels or whatever, right? Um, or rims from like a barrel kind of thing, right? But they get it rolling and they have just a stick, right? We would use our hands, whatever, because we were poor and couldn't afford sticks, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, you start to get this thing rolling and like you have to get a certain amount of momentum going and inertia for it to not be wobbling all over the place, right? You want to get enough speed that it, it rolls true, right? And then what you're using the stick of your hand for is just to either keep it moving or to touch lightly on either side as it's going to keep it true or to steer it around corners and stuff like that, right? So there's this guidance, right? And these three levels can be seen the same way, right? There's a shit ton of work that goes into the first level, right? Because you got to develop uh, physical ability, right? Health, uh, coordination, timing, all kinds of stuff like that, right? So that's like the, the you're just getting it rolling, right? And there's that little wobbliness and all that kind of stuff, right? And then the second level, right? You've got all this momentum going. And so you can you can increase it. You can keep it going. You can steer it. Those kind of things, right? You can start to steer little things and all that, right? But eventually, right, you just need to touch things just lightly, right? Just a little bit of a touch, just a little touch here or there, right? To keep, to, to guide it, right? So it takes less and less of your effort, less and less of your time, less and less monitoring. It's just, a, you know, but again, again it, it requires momentum. It requires energy. It requires, it requires a shit ton of execution, right? To where you've got so much momentum going that you're getting a return on your investment. Everything is working together, right? And you get this synergistic effect, right? Synergy is where not only is everything working together, but the end result is far greater than the sum and input of all the individual parts, right? It's not an equal outcome, which is what really what pisses people off who don't understand how this kind of stuff works, right? They don't understand leverage. They don't understand, you know, uh, the, the, how these principles work. And they're natural laws. They're natural principles. It's what Nijitsu is based on, right? They get pissed off at people who have more money. They get pissed off at people who have greater success or whatever, right? Because they must be cheating. They must be, no, right? They have things in place that are working and each is feeding each other. And the outcome produces a far greater result than the people that are just trading time for money, you know, trying to run around and make sure that their significant other is happy so that they don't lose them, so that they're alone, so that, there's a, man, there's a shit ton of effort in all that stuff, right? So how do you, right? But that's, the question is where things have to start, right? The how's why we have programs, right? Uh, I'm going to fire up James here because, not fire him up, but you know what I mean? I'm going to pull him out of the shadows. <laughs> Yeah. You the, thanks. I made you the big boy. I should have kept you there. Anyway, <coughs> but James, James could probably speak on this a little bit. Um, there's nothing that we're we're doing in any with our, any of our team stuff or anything with growing warrior concepts or whatever that's not it's not leverage. It's not you know it's not 
planning and, and strategic stuff and whatnot. Um, you know, it's it's no different, right? It's all everything should be return on investment, right? Uh, you know, with our with our physical techniques, everybody starts in the beginner level where you've got you know four or five moves. Each move does something. This one evades. This one breaks balance. This one takes them down. This one locks them up. Whatever, right? But shit, by second degree black belt, you're doing all five of those things, but you've got what, two moves, right? Three moves, whatever. Um, everything just keeps getting smaller and smaller, and you're learning how to make this happen, right? That every move is doing more than one thing, right? But your training is doing the same thing as well, right? Physical training is setting up that evasive, dissuasion, escape stuff. That's set. All this is feeding that higher level thing where you know, there's less and less to do. Anyway, you, you, you leaned in a couple of times. I knew you had to have been thinking about uh, something. Do you have any aha moments you want to toss on the fire here? Uh, the entire thing just reminded me of we were talking about recently uh, back when Hatsumi Sensei first met Takamatsu Sensei and he was asked, you know, you have all this physical skill, but can you survive? You know, just anything, not just the, you know, a physical attack by another person, but can you survive, you know, anything that comes at you in life? You know, kind of that idea that, you know, it supersedes just the physical techniques and everything. And I know myself, I've talked to you recently about how many times, you know, at work or whatever, you know, I've used more uh, ukemi and stuff, and break falls and whatnot to save, you know, myself from injury and things like that. And just you've caught with, falling you know, tools, I've falling caught, power yeah. tools and stuff, and caught them on handle. Nothing like you weren't fumbling around, and you know, with those nail yeah. guns, you could have shot yourself a couple of times. A couple of times, <laughs> right? But there's that mental thing that's happening where it's almost like time slows down. Yeah. And you're able to just kind of, I mean, everything, you know, there's this fast moment, life is going on, and all of a sudden, it's like a, a movie special effect, right? Brrr. You reach out <laughs> and grab it, part of your brain's going, holy shit, how'd I know that? Meanwhile, somebody next to you is mimicking or is, is, is copying that same thing, right? Holy shit, how'd you do that? Kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> can you survive in, the, in those upper levels? I, you know, when, again, when people are thinking self-defense, I get it survival, right? But ultimately our amygdala, right? This little, this little beacon or sensor in your brain, right? That watches out for danger, right? From the cave, it was anything that could eat you, kill you, whatever. Right. So it'll, it'll send a signal to your hypothalamus, your hypothalamus drops, epinephrine and all kinds of shit into your bloodstream, right? Put your, put your, uh, your cells into an altered state for fight, flight, or freeze, right? You go about your business, right? But in the modern world, see, a lot of that safety has been kind of hidden, right? Unless the boogeyman comes out of the darkness as a gangbanger, thug, whatever, right? Um, we kind of get dull to that. Right. Meanwhile, we have developed a personality. We've developed goals and dreams and we've developed fears. Anybody who's ever been poor and has pulled themselves out of that probably doesn't want to go back. So money sensitivity, anybody that might get around them that might throw those kind of things off and create that kind of a situation, pull the carpet out from under them. Right. That danger is no real than no no less real than a saber tooth tiger to the to the subconscious mind, right? So the amygdala is watching for that shit too, right? Um, people that need to be liked, people that need to be seen as you know something or somebody, right? Anything that could threaten to shake that, the amygdala is going to trigger, the hypothalamus is going to trigger, the state's going to trigger, right? But all that self protection. Right? So how do you defend yourself against those things, right? How do you how do you produce significant success in your life and have 
the ability to withstand somebody, some group, whatever, contact the media and drag your ass through the mud to the point where you might lose your family, you might lose everything you own, you're certainly going to lose your reputation for a while, right? But you know what? All that shit passes because they'll find something else to jump onto as soon as something bigger comes along, right? But could you withstand a year and a half of ridicule and being drugged through the papers, right? Only to be found innocent, not guilty, whatever, at the other end. And be okay with yourself, regardless of what anybody else thought of you. I'm not talking to you, James. Alone. I'm talking to everybody. Okay? That's self-protection, too. Right? Think about all the decisions you make that are made because of a fear to be disliked, a fear to not be accepted, a fear to not be loved, a fear that somebody else might look at you badly because you laughed at that guy's joke or didn't correct them on this little piece of speech that they used or whatever. Think about all the decisions that you make. Okay? And yet we're worried about being attacked by somebody with a fist. Can you be okay? <clears throat> I care what rich guy you think of, whatever, right? Everybody wants to slam them. And if they think that dragging their name through the mud is going to bother them, right? The most successful people developed one very important skill. They don't give a shit about what anybody else thinks of them. They are secure in their decisions and actions because it produces the results they're looking to produce. And they also know that at least half the planet's not going to like them. But if they make their decisions based on that half of the planet, the other half doesn't benefit. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, whatever, right? Okay. You think the people that they freaking give paychecks to, right, give a flying shit about what anybody else says about their boss? All they can. Now, they would shit their pants if their boss folded. Because if everything fell apart, they'd be out of a job. So half the world's dragging them through the mud. The other path is like, thank you for being as successful as you are because I get paid well um, and I'm taken care of. And I know lots of people would like to argue because they're not being paid well. But you know what? Um, the person who takes all the risk, right, that risk losing everything if they're wrong, in my book, should get paid way freaking more than the person who can quit at any moment and go get a different job. Sorry. You don't have to like that either. Okay. Risk equals reward. Times execution. Actually, risk times execution equals reward. The reward will always be equal to or greater than the level of risk and the work put into execution. You do eight times five, maybe with some overtime at a certain base rate, and you take the rest of the time off, and the focus is always on whatever the fun stuff's going to be, um, and I don't need that much. I only need this much, and this is my level of acceptance. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't say anything about the people that are working their asses off and are executing in a higher degree because they probably run the company that you're working for. It is what it is, right? Anyway, so in that higher level, right, levels two and three, <coughs> don't discount your ability to weather the storms that have nothing to do with fist, feet, knives, and guns. Can you survive? Anyway, anybody, uh, is anybody on? I, I, I still see some people, right? Questions, comments, <coughs> hey, everybody said hey. hey. <laughs> I saw little things popping up, but 
they, they pop up for half a second and they go away and I'm, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on a roll. So anyway, what do you got? Uh, Julia said my value of myself is not as dependent on others as it used to be. Good. Good. Now there's a balance to that, right? Because no person's an Island unto themselves. The trick is in aligning yourself with people that have similar goals even though they might have the opposite personality types because you need the opposite personality types to either keep you grounded or to provide bigger dreams and more fuel to keep you going when you, most people most people that start businesses or start little groups or organizations right want to surround themselves by people just like them well that's a recipe for disaster because i have an entrepreneurial mind which means I'm a fucking idea man. I'm an idea factory, right? Holy shit, right? I need people to go, whoa, can, can we put that over here? Because we can only do like two or three of these at a time, right? So that kind of thing. I, I, I don't need to be surrounded by yes men or anything like that. What I need are, and my guys know, right? If you're good at something, explain it to me so I understand how it works. But this is on you. This is... Okay, I'm just going to make sure that the machine's still running and whatever. Don't lie to me. And if there's something that I need to know about it, tell me about it. Right. But I do need to understand how it works and how it fits in. But I don't need to know how to do it because I don't have time for the learning curve. James just had to talk to somebody um, who kept calling my cell phone because I didn't see it as a mistake. I saw it as an expedient a while back. Right. They scheduled a call. I made the call on my cell phone. Well, that was the number they had. They needed help with something they had ordered or whatever. James knows what it is, right? Um, but they were calling my cell phone right in the middle of meetings and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, I didn't answer it, right? Not only did I not answer it, because my cell phone is not a beacon for everybody else to reach out and touch me because they have time. I'm betting you have 10 times more time available in your life than I do. Okay? And that's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> um, but I, if you're having a problem with like not receiving something, an email will do because James will jump on that. That's not, you imagine buying a toaster and it didn't work. So you call the CEO of Procter and Gamble and go, hey, my toaster's not working. Can you fix it? Yes, yeah, Sensei, but you're not Procter and Gamble. You're my teacher. Mm, yeah, no, no. I know all the names of people I have teacher-student relationships with. And even so, if they contacted me because they needed something to be downloaded, right, um, I'm going to tell one of my other people, <laughs> can you email that? Um, or you might get an email from me at 1.30 in the morning because I go, hmm, shit. You know, instead of telling them to do it, I have time, I'll just send it out because I'm going to be on that service and I need to grab those three links to do this thing, I might as well just grab that, throw it in an email and send it out to them. Anyway. All right. What else do we got? Oh, there's a, there, before I forget, before I forget, there was a really good book. I think it was written. I think it was written in the mid to late seventies, maybe the early eighties. Uh, the author's name is Terry Cole Whitaker. Cole Whitaker is hyphenated, right? So Terry Cole Whitaker. Um, she wrote a really good book at the end of every chapter. There is a, there's exercises to be done. Okay. Really great book. Highly recommended. Okay. It's called what you think of me is none of my business. Okay. Stop being led around by people who have no fucking idea where they're going or where they think they're going today is different than yesterday. And is going to be different from, from tomorrow. Okay. They don't, they don't have a plan. Their plan is to get whatever they want and to get everybody else to help them get, the, get what they want. So you're going to have to have thicker skin, right? And in the process of, of doing the work, doing the correct work, oh, people that love you are going to have a hell of a time with you. Half of them are going to not be happy because you're changing because you're not as easily controlled. And the other half are going to fear for your safety because you don't understand and they don't want you to hurt yourself. Right? 
if you ever saw the kids car kids uh, animated movie called Madagascar, right? Just do what the penguins do. Smile and wave, boys. Just smile and wave. Right? And keep on with your plan. <clears throat> what else? Who else? <clears throat> oh, boy, I'm really gonna have to hit my inhaler. Wow. That's actually it. Really? Holy shit. Really? I guess people didn't want to hear about this as much as I thought they did. Either that or all, they're all in uber pensive mode. All right. <clears throat> and maybe some people got lost this time because um, I cut back on the number of Facebook pages we were simulcasting on. I was just stupid. I mean, why would it be? Why would I simulcast something that's a once a week kind of thing, right? On my Facebook page and online Ninja uh, Academy. When we have a Kuden podcast group page that it's supposed to be on, and if you don't want to be on Facebook or you don't want to, to you know, follow a certain page or whatever, great. We're on YouTube and we're on Twitter and we're on LinkedIn. I don't need to be on YouTube for uh, Facebook for different ways from Sunday and whatever. Okay. I mean, I'm all about helping people train and practice and learn, but Jesus Christ, I'm also here about teaching people how to be ninja and not just goonies that show up for a self-defense class twice a week. Right. Everybody wants to be, but it's like that Mike Tyson thing, right? Everybody's got a plan to get punched in the mouth. Right. Everybody wants to be a ninja or a martial arts black belt or a warrior or whatever until they find out how much work is involved. Holy shit. Just tell, just tell me where to put my feet. Well, then you're not going to like it when I give you the list of books that I want you to read either. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's that. Right. <laughs> anyway. All right. Is that all we have? Yes, sir. All right. So. Three abilities, right? The reverse is that the ideal is set up your life so that you danger never even thinks about coming in your direction. When that fails temporarily, like nature or something slipped through or whatever, right? Um, uh, or you're not quite there yet, right? Then we're going to use stealth and escape tactics and all that kind of stuff, right? Because the goal, the ideal is still what? Danger can't touch me, right? Danger can't touch me. So ideal, back up. When that fails or we're just getting started out and we're nowhere close to those things, then, yeah, I have to actually physically avoid and, and handle those things, right? But the path is physical, leads to more mental creativity, ingenuity, that kind of stuff, leads to invincibility slash invisibility. Ultimately, there's no such thing as invincibility, right? Which is depicted in a lot of Buddhist temples where they have these walking meditation paths. And at the end of the path, there is a hut with a human skeleton. I almost said live human skeleton, <laughs> a real human skeleton hanging in it, right? And it's a dead end, right? Because it's a reminder. I don't care what you believe about what happens after life or anything like that. As a human being in this condition with these faculties, Ichigo Ichie, one life, one chance. Okay. All right. That's it. That's all I got. We're going to wrap this up and I'll talk to everybody again next time on Kuden. Get more of Kuden Radio. Subscribe to your favorite podcasting site or subscribe at ModernNinjaWarrior.com.